Day 1 I find myself caught between the desire to teach and positively impact more people and not wanting to become a slave to the online world. I remind myself consistently of the quote by Buddha, which says, When the student is ready, the teacher will appear which in my current state of mind means there is no need to push so hard. The ones who are ready will find me. But is to run into the lessons I give enough to make internal shifts in those people that are suffering? I know many people that listen but not absorb the lessons I give, and I wonder to myself, why? Some say they are ready for change, that they are applying the teachings and yet suffer still. This begs the question of which part of them is ready and which part is too invested in their old and consistent ways. Certainly, someone who has had the talk with themselves, adopts an open mind, and applies what is taught will get the change, right? I've found this to be untrue. If the sacrifice for change is too great to the part of them which commands the ship. What sacrifice, you may ask? The ones related to survival and habit. Career survival. Social status survival. Physical survival. Close relationship survival. Culture survival may outweigh the desire for improved mental well-being. If one, for example, believes that worry and anxiety was connected to productivity and climbs up the career ladder, they will live in the realm of addiction to suffering and sabotage any good or positive progress that shows up. Or a 20-year marriage which has gone stale due to the comfort and safety of having another person around. This person is potentially too invested in his certainty, and although a part of them might get a dopamine rush thinking of the idea around true fulfillment and positive change, it would come at the expense of losing their connection to their significant other mentally and emotionally. Life is a constant inner dig to find the right answers that will lead to our desired results. And as I sit here on this old chair, sipping a beautiful coconut contently, I'm torn between listening to the voice in my head that says, this coconut tastes kind of funky. Could there be something wrong with it? and turning my attention fully to the birds singing in the background. If I investigate into the coconut further, it'll potentially lead me to concern over the possibility of getting sick. Then, I'll have to go online and give the coconut shop a bad review. This could lead to karma coming right back and getting me when I least expect it. Who knows? I might even be traumatized by coconuts forever. Okay, it's the birds. I'll choose to focus on the melody from the birds and give uncertainty with the coconut a chance. I've gotten much better at embracing uncertainty and seeing things at the level that they are and not worse than what they are which helps to reduce the amount of energy used up when what-if thinking no longer exists. Sometimes I wonder if the most recently evolved part of our brains, known as the neocortex, was beneficial to humankind or not. The birds, the geckos, the dogs, the salamander that just casually walked by me, all look pretty content while us humans fight for our survival seemingly every moment of every day. These animals get a taste of their fight-or-flight system every once in a while. This begs the question of, 
do we actually think we're thinking, or are we just remembering what happened to us from our past? Are we thinking ourselves into an internal frenzy, or are our emotions consistently overriding our logic and our abilities to see past the potential catastrophe? The birds have now stopped, and the sunset has brought with it the pleasant sounds of crickets. Pleasant to my newly optimized identity, which has taken a good few years to analyze and build. Noisy ruckus to my old self that wouldn't be able to bear the chirps of a few innocent crickets. Misery attracts more misery. Pleasantness attracts more pleasantness. At this point in my life, it's as if I've simply traded one pair of glasses for another. Even the talks of potential World War III by my peers who've been glued to the telly for the past few weeks couldn't deter me from my connection to the calming power of the universe. When you know the path a certain idea will take you, you no longer choose to go down that path of self-destruction. To adopt the ideas of others would be to play the game of life safely. To build your connections at the risk, of course, of putting your own well-being on the line. I'd rather risk embarrassment and disconnect with others and have a true say from the voice of my awakened higher self. It's interesting how intuition, simply knowing, overshadows thought when a person has revealed a state of inner awakening. You're in the hands of source energy that wants what's best for you, and somehow knows what's best for you also. Some may be saying, oh, Dennis, you're speaking such nonsense. I'm not a spiritual person and can't truly connect to what you're preaching. To that I say, are you truly happy with the results in your life right now? Or is there a part of you who feels you deserve more and can experience more in this lifetime? What is the point of carrying around belief systems that although may be connected to your authority figures and friends, gives you Such a narrow perspective over yourself and the world. At what point will you brew up a deep inner sense of dissatisfaction within you and begin to see things for the first time again? To live in a miserable comfort zone means to live your life based around the associations your mind has created. To bypass the beauties around nature, strangers, your friends and family, and much, much more. What if, starting this moment, you looked around and saw everything for the first time? You listened to everything for the first time. Touched, smelt, and tasted everything for the first time. What would you think about your life then? I wonder. As I sit across my son right now, even I, as a person who strengthens his self awareness by the day, sees the incredible speed in which he's growing up. When did he get so tall? I wondered to myself. Even the most committed to the practice of self mastery recognizes aspects of life that they've missed out on being mindful over and move forward with self-love and full acceptance. Day 2 As I woke up this morning, I had an inner urge to check up and respond to people online needing my help. But how would I be able to provide the best and most targeted feedback if I hadn't fulfilled my own mind, body, spirit needs first. Good catch, Dennis. On I went with my regular morning meditation practice, 
followed by my newly developed practice of Qigong. It's amazing what 20 minutes of self-love can do for your perceptions around the day ahead. The ones that begin the day giving back to themselves regularly turn into deliberate thinkers over default thinkers. Since the brain and heart are always in communication between thoughts and feelings about things, a deliberate thinker has a chance to bypass their regular impulsive reactions to life. This can bring up a perspective that may not have been tapped into during moments of internal or external challenges in the past. This deliberate thinker, having started the day off with habits that provide loving self-care, now has a more neutral and possibly even pleasant emotional response to the challenge. One small step for the warrior within, one great leap towards a new identity. Anything unfamiliar, though, to a bodily system that has been so invested in inner and outer chaos is unsafe. So in typical fashion, a person may go searching for the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual pains and discomforts and surely find it once more. This doesn't make them a bad person. Only a person that has no clear idea of where they're going. Feeling and thinking in right ways is a good idea to them, but deep down, do they feel it is deserved? Do they feel detachment from their loved ones that may have fed them these ideas in the first place? Do they gain a deeper sense of significance staying put in the mud rather than dancing carefree in the rain? It's the missing pieces of information that keeps a person stuck in their past minds and bodies. The inability to see things through the eyes of mom and dad who were doing the best they could with the information they had. The inability to release the emotional charge connected to the schoolyard bullies in third grade that embarrassed you in front of others. Was it really? All about you? Or were these bullies being bullied by their intoxicated parents each day when they got home from school? Every minute of every day, we're making a choice, either consciously or unconsciously. It's in our abilities to tap into our inner energy reserves and consciously choose that holds the key to a new you. When life feels like it's snowballing in a chaotic direction, it's only because you've allowed the unconscious you, the pre-programmed you, to run the ship. What do you think is going to happen when a bunch of rowers on a ship lead the direction of the ship without seeing where they're going or knowing their destination? It's the captain that places the orders for where the ship will go, based on the greater vision of where their destination is. Are you captaining your own ship? Or are you being led to the rocks each time because you're not clear about your destination and not taking the right actions to get there? Remember, it's in the moments of great challenges that hold the opportunity for your greatest growth as a person. Don't run from and weaken in the moments of unexpected or expected fear. A deliberate thinker sees the beautiful end result as a result of stepping out of their normal responses. Cementing the fact that you are truly limitless in what you can do and who you want to become. The magic is always just outside your comfort zone, but the only one that can recognize it is you. As the motivation molecule called dopamine 
rushes through your body in this moment of inspiration and truth, we must also recognize the resistance to change that will show up. Because where there is a potential change in what you believe to be true, how you see yourself, or what others may think about this change comes with the sabotaging of any forward progress. This is why resistance must be anticipated and acknowledged. Rather than becoming stunned by its presence and weakening our resolve because of it. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. And there is no greater challenge we'll ever face than the ones we face within. The ones related to changing our identities from who we think we are to who we deserve to be. Because, as I've noticed in my life, there seems to be this consistent, invisible communication going on between a part of us and the universe. Our external results seem to be in line with the emotions we project the most consistently. People addicted to suffering find many opportunities in their day to continue to experience suffering. The brain begins creating a filter system that perceives things in a way that leads to further suffering. This process seems to also flow in this manner for content people, grateful people, opportunistic people. Your results are a direct result of your life metaphor. Some people have a life metaphor like happiness is something that must be earned. Others have an approach like life is an exciting roller coaster ride. Ask yourself, what's your life metaphor? How do you view life in general? And where might have this idea manifested from? You know, it's amazing how we can redirect the path our lives take if we only take a few moments each day to analyze where our belief systems came from. Most people can't find 15 minutes in their entire day to reflect on how they've become who they are today. It saddens me. It truly does. Mainly because humanity is losing the battles put up by large organizations that profit greatly by keeping you confused, bewildered, and even sick. The ignorant will think otherwise, but the ones who are awakening will begin questioning themselves and life as a whole. And once those seeds of reflection and questioning have been planted, they begin to get watered. Answers begin showing up, and we start seeing everything around us for the first time again. Just the way it should be for as long as we are alive. Day 3 As I sit this evening, putting my mind on these sheets of paper, I reflect on a day that many would coin to be wasted. I intended to focus on opposing the darkness within at every turn when I woke up this morning. Work harder. Lift heavier. Do more. That wretched voice within me said. So I worked less. Lifted lighter and did less instead. It's incredible how gratifying it can be to deny yourself of something you think you need, but you really don't. How quickly the voice of gentleness and content shows up the moment we oppose mom and dad's voices that play out like a record within us. As the chain of do, 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 and B, B, B got broken within me, I felt the release of a program that was installed many years back. We are incredibly complex and sophisticated creatures, 
which can lead to the possibility of making our lives much more complicated than they need to be. So I sit here, chalking one win up in favor of liberation and placing the label of a useless day farther out of my vocabulary. As the great philosopher Winnie the Pooh says, people say nothing is impossible, but I do nothing every day. Incredible how much we can learn from that so-called bear with very little brain. Life seems to be about the amassing of an unbelievable amount of information, making associations between all that information and hopefully leading to a fulfilling life. My biggest concern with humanity today, though, is that the associations and belief systems we hold may be the very things leading to the addiction to suffering. The other problem is that we're not very equipped to analyze ourselves and learn how to think rather than just react to external stimulus. No one ever taught us how to analyze and think our way fruitfully through life, which makes us less to blame for our results, and yet fully responsible for creating a new identity. Someone once asked me what the best way to analyze and shift your mental and emotional challenges might be. My answer was so simple that it stunned him, and he wasn't able to fully grasp the concept at the time. I told him one word, pause. You see, between the recognition of an external stimulus and the impulsiveness action that you take, either to run, fight, or freeze, you have a window of opportunity. If you can tap into the fact that your emotional response is directly related to past experiences and you're fed up enough with missing out on so much of life, you do the very thing your subconscious hopes you won't do in that moment. Pause. To pause in the face of fear is to tap into more options in terms of reactions in that moment. To pause also sends a clear signal to your nervous system that the very thing it is associated to being a threat is no longer a threat. In time, the previous irrational ideas that the mind has been carrying around start to flatten out. By pausing, it forces a person to see the true colors behind the things that was feared previously. As the body may become reactive in terms of bodily sensations, your resolve doesn't change. You are now one with the infinite possibilities that this universe presents, and you've taken your first step towards ending the addiction to suffering. To end the addiction to suffering, one must find a new addiction, the opposite, of course, which would be the addiction to unconditional love. Starting with yourself. How many of us wake up in the morning, walk over to the mirror, and dread the face that we see? Most of us. It takes intention and self-awareness to look in that mirror and pick apart the parts you're in love with. When we look in the mirror with dread and disgust, we fuel the need to do something, hear something, purchase something, in order for us to flip around our judgment over ourselves. It becomes a daily fight to tap into a small piece of self-worth so that we can then shift our interpretations of other things in the world. Unconditional love for ourselves 
means to accept, understand, and release the negative meanings we've been carrying around since childhood. It means to give up trying to please everyone and live up to the expectations and labels that others have placed upon us. In any given situation, every person has a very specific checklist that must be met in order for their conditional love for themselves and others to show up. During work hours, someone's unconscious checklist for self-worth might look a little like this. 1. Get a minimum of three comments about how good I look. 2. Not feel anxious during a meeting. 3. Not have anyone stare at me funny during lunch. 4. Be complimented on my new hairdo. 5. To not get honked at while driving home from work. Everyone has a different checklist for when they have permission to feel worthy, happy, and loved. The smaller the checklist in any given situation, the faster unconditional love shows up, along with a deep sense of gratitude. The deeper the checklist goes, the more complicated a person's life becomes. The more temporary pleasures they indulge in, and the more extreme their emotional states become. The addiction to suffering gets strengthened, and the person turns into a complete slave to their habits. In this state of mind and body, we begin confusing our wants with needs. It might be okay to want to be told we're beautiful, but it's not a need connected to our levels of self-worth. This is one of the many lessons I've adopted by living in Bali, Indonesia at the time of writing this. Many couldn't conceive the idea of living in a poor third world country like Indonesia. But what about the benefits? What about the people that smile at you without a desire for something back? Or the local who climbs a coconut tree, opens it up, and serves it to you out of pure love and appreciation for being on their land. This kind of unconditional love permeates across every cell in a person's body and within eight feet of another person. Since the heart is the strongest electromagnetic force in the body, the feelings and intentions that a person habitually lives with can be unconsciously tapped into and felt by another. So love is met with more love. Hate is met with more hate. And the results a person experiences is expected, although many times it wouldn't seem this way to the person in the moment. Day 4 You know, it's incredible what one good success story can do for a sufferer's morale. In the case of an anxiety disorder, I've been told many times over and over how my personal success over anxiety and emotional distress has provided such hope for others. My only concern is that hope doesn't become the only strategy that someone uses to reach a place of inner peace. To hope is a good starting point, and your faith in freedom can build through the process of engaging in small wins each and every day. How quickly, though, we forget the progress we make and revert back to what's still missing internally or externally in our lives. What's missing is always available so is how far you've come. A belief system that revolves around lack 
will never see the answers to freedom, even if it slaps them in the face. Our entire way of life revolves around our belief systems. Many times, these beliefs get passed down from generation to generation. The idea of breaking that cycle to a person looking to make changes in their lives can be very, very frightening. And can you really blame them at the beginning of their spiritual journey towards inner awakening? At the ages of zero to two, firmly attached to the delta brainwave state, your sponge-like brain took in all the truths that surrounded you from your authority figures. Those truths or ideas weren't questioned for years, sometimes even ever. From ages 2 to 6, delta brainwaves were presented, which meant a building upon the lessons learned earlier. I work with many people who look like they've just come back from multiple wars at the front line, battling to do what they think is the right thing to do, and always seemingly coming up short. Coming up short on good feelings, money, interactions, and much, much more. These people are far from weak, and I can go as far as to say they are some of the strongest people I've ever had the pleasure of helping but they lack the open-mindedness and open-heartedness to vividly see past the cycle that keeps them stuck, which is the cycle of worry, which is connected to the sense of familiarity, which connects to a familiar need for certainty, which has been ultimately connected to their identity. These people, many times, seem to be lacking acknowledgement in the fact that the problem is at an identity level. A shift in thinking about something must reach a deep enough level for it to cause a shift at an emotional level. So if the thoughts without the feelings change, there will still be a disconnect between the brain and the heart communication, resulting in reverting back to the old familiar ways. I've personally found it to be extremely powerful when an anxiety sufferer starts viewing their thoughts, sensations, urges, and reactions to be coming from the six-year-old living within them. The same six-year-old that was experiencing deep emotional traumas way back then. Would you ever belittle a six-year-old? I ask my clients. They say, no, never. Would you ever think along the same lines of a six-year-old who's concerned about a feeling in their body, telling them that, yes, it could in fact be a catastrophic physical ailment. No, they say. I would comfort them and be optimistic. Okay. Would you beat them up when they ask for something out of fear and confusion? No, they say, never. I would console them and show them the truth behind what they fear. Okay. So why do you feel it's okay to do all these things to the six-year-old living within you? Isn't it unfair, misleading, unhealthy, irrational? Well, yes, they say. I've never seen it from that angle before. The six-year-old within us, who perceives events today in a confused and catastrophic manner, must be guided, taught, led, not misled. He or she must be met with a gentle voice, 
not harsh criticism. When you can adopt the perspective that every inner challenge is connected to your six-year-old, you will embark on the journey of properly utilizing your thinking and analytical brain. You will no longer be led astray by the emotional and survival mechanism that continues to limit your life. Oh, what a beautiful and satisfying feeling it is to take control of what we have control over and release ourselves from the need to control the things that we can't. Do you ever realize how quickly the creative genius within you can show up when these principles are finally applied? Your imagination becomes geared in the direction of the best possible scenarios with unlimited possibilities attached to it, rather than a catastrophic end. If your inner child feels safe, you will feel safe. If the inner child is happy, you will be happy. It's amazing how quickly your perceptions over past experiences can change when you can begin responding to challenges rather than reacting. So, it's true of the saying, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. What a beautiful saying that emphasizes the idea that our perspectives are shaped by our internal model of the world. Our emotional states in the moment our past memories related to the situation, and our ability or inability for self-awareness. The problem many times becomes the fact that many of us believe we will live forever. We don't recognize the urgency of creating a new internal model in the brain of who we are and what the world is. Imagine the regret weighing so heavily on top of you during the moment of lying in your deathbed. What would you have given to work less, smile more, prioritize yourself? Your hopes and prayers will be dashed in those moments because God will remind you of how many chances you already left behind. Oh, what tremendous pain. To live a good and virtuous life means to live a life where you're proud of yourself. Today, for instance, as I swam in the local swimming pool, I was stung by a bee right in the top of my head. As I saw the dying bee lay before me, and an ice pack on my head, feeling grateful I didn't have to deal with the stinger stuck to my skull, I felt for the bee. This feeling doesn't necessarily make me a good person, but a compassionate one. To love the ones that have hurt us is the greatest freedom of all. What other challenge could possibly stand in your way after forgiving those from your past, not at a head and thinking level, but at the level of your heart. I personally can't think of a greater feat for a human being. I've heard my mentors from the past consistently tell me that love heals everything. It took me a while to truly understand this teaching, but in the end, I understood it, and I believed it. To love is to bypass fear, because fear can only survive when there is no sign of love. I think I'll take the rest of the day to implement this lesson. The question is, what will you do? Day 5 As I walked off the tennis court 
having just played a few hours of tennis with a friend. I had a very harsh and demoralizing viewpoint over the back injury I suffered while we were playing. As the adrenaline and endorphins were no longer active minutes after the end of our match, I realized that I was very much mortal. It's interesting how a bump in the river caused by a log can make you re-evaluate so many things. That entire day, the only thing I was capable of doing was to sit upright. Laying down, and any twists in movement sent me down a painful path. It wasn't too long, however, before I turned my focus from my limits to my capabilities. I had no restrictions over my mind, my imagination, my perceptions, my ability to attach and detach from any thoughts, my level of compassion for myself and others, and much, much more. You see, I've been a professional tennis player a few years back, and all throughout my years in the sport, my body hardly ever succumbed to any injury. So this back pain I felt was a brand new experience in so many ways. An experience that would test my ability to disallow the ego mind to run my days. An experience that would test my patience as I allowed my body to heal naturally and in time. And an experience that would open up my eyes to the physical vulnerabilities we all grow into over time. As nightfall came, I found myself more grateful than ever to have been experiencing my back injury. As I gingerly walked over to my water cooler, I chuckled at myself. The chuckle turned into a full-blown hysterical laugh. As my fiancé at the time of writing this recognized my laughing state, she asked, What's so funny? I replied, I've just tapped in to a level of inner freedom that feels more freeing than anything. And with that new recognition, I've allowed whatever emotions that want to show up to move through me without limiting them. A semi-complex answer to a simple question, I guess. But it truly was freeing, and my system wanted to express that freedom through hysterical laughter. So I let it. Pain is due to restriction. Restricting ourselves from feeling good about something. Restricting ourselves from smiling at a complete stranger. Restricting our internal organs from living in a homeostatic environment due to the tension we bring to each moment. These restrictions are due to accepting and living in line with the status quo. We mirror the ways of others without analyzing what might be right from wrong. God forbid we don't get a smile back from a stranger, how demoralizing that experience could be. These types of restrictions are very much due to the laws you've consciously and unconsciously laid out for yourself. We despise people that step off that plane and step into a pleasant emotional state because it goes against the flow of pain we're all so consistently surrounded with. But a certain amount of courage and willpower must be applied in order to consistently emphasize a new viewpoint over external occurrences to fuel a more pleasant state. You must choose what reality you want to live in. 
You can either move with the herd of sheep, a slave to playing this game of life small, hoping not to step on too many shoes, and living to please others who you hold so high on the pedestal, or you can choose to move with the herd of wolves, ruthlessly defying any inner voices of doubt and fear, walking with pride and self-worth, knowing you've knocked down obstacle after obstacle in your life, and being an example for others through your actions and not just your words. Or, there's a final reality you could live in, that of following the herd of koalas, the middle ground. Koalas appreciate their tranquility. They enjoy their quiet and are highly content with their simple lives. Of course, they have very well-established territories between them and the other koalas. But this reality in the end is very much similar to a life of a dedicated stoic. So which reality will you choose? The person who doesn't engage in thinking and choosing a path for themselves leaves their fate in the hands of others? Someone else will certainly choose your identity for you should you decide that thinking is too unfamiliar a practice and revert back to familiarity, meaning a reactive lifestyle. Warrior, I'm not here to convince you of one path over another. That's solely up to you if the change is to last a lifetime. You see it in many people today who live in a victim-like identity. They'll quickly tell you the list of things they have and that they are. I have OCD. I am an anxiety sufferer. I am incapable. Now, add up all those identity statements one reminds themselves and others of daily, and you have a person addicted to suffering. The pessimistic person touches on the answers they need to create positive changes within, but can't do anything with them. They are just too highly invested in lack and doubt. That is, until they choose a new path. A path that comes with the sacrifice of the old identity. There truly is nothing more beautiful than seeing a person's transition from the darkness to the light. With love in their heart, they proceed through life gently guiding themselves and being guided towards a grander well-being. The person begins seeing each cup as half full rather than half empty, and proudly sticks out of the crowd of sheep, desperately wanting to pull them back in. Warrior, it's time to stop seeking inspiration and to start becoming inspirational. Day 6 It's my son, Hyatt's birthday today, and I'm told this also means that it's dad says yes to everything day. My analytical mind quickly jumps in and weighs the pros and cons, the fun, and the potential pitfalls of his request. More like command, actually. My response was an approval, within limits, of course and we took on the day which started with the purchase of a book that he chose. This was followed by a pizza lunch, ping pong with friends, and dessert. Everything was going according to the rules of my nine-year-old. 
until Daddy decided that he wanted to have a cup of tea. Keep in mind, this was one of those special occasions for my little one, who's already consistently tapped in to the importance of healthy eating, physical exercise, and a clear mindset. As we sat down at the cafe, Hyatt was visibly upset. When I asked him what was wrong, his response was, This isn't the way Dad says yes to everything day works, Daddy. My intention was to see how fast he would be able to tap into gratitude for the day, as I knew no kid would like this kind of state break during a day of such fun. I quickly reminded him of the three steps to defying your ego mind. Step one, pause. Step two, breathe three deep breaths in. Step three, tap in to a new perspective. A simple formula that can be hard to remember for an adult, let alone a child of nine years old. Nonetheless, his self-awareness had to be strengthened that moment, and he proceeded to apply the ego-defying formula. After a few moments, he was visibly transitioning from the selfish him to the compassionate him. I'm a big believer in the idea that if you want to get to know what an adult is really like, just look at his children, and you'll recognize subtle aspects that show either deliberate thinking or reactive thinking. The child is a mirror of his authority figures, and the staggering number of kids taking antidepressants is heart-wrenching. This is a direct effect of parental guidance that doesn't support an empowered way of seeing things. What the adult does, the child becomes. Sucky parents are to blame because the decision was never made to commit to the change process themselves. The dissatisfaction was never there, and the reasons for this change was never brought to the forefront of their life each and every day. Reasons come before results. It is the fuel to staying on track towards a shift in belief systems and identity. Now, I don't consider myself the ultimate dad, but I do pride myself on staying conscious of my own behaviors since I know my son's subconscious is noting down everything. You could see it in his body language. Now, a simple three-step system altered his viewpoints over what his ego mind says. He was able to access the big picture within and not succumb to a narrow idea in that moment. The rest of the day was as fun as could be, and rational thinking won the day. Show me a person struggling mentally and emotionally, and I'll show you a life without any structure in it. It's the systems we put in place that lead to a feeling of inner self-mastery and to quickly tapping in to solutions for external challenges. Personally, I find a great deal of balance and satisfaction from splitting my day into three separate parts. Morning, afternoon, and evening. I remind myself of what I like to accomplish for each part. For example, evening downtime and peace, and bring one skill set for each part of the day to meet my goal. Breaking down your greatest challenges provides you with options and clarity. The day isn't so intimidating when it's cut into three parts. This way, 
the thinking mind shows up more often and the emotional mind is more rested. Along these lines, we can also come to understand why we do what we do, even if it harms us in some way. Speaking to others about your challenges constantly in the hopes of getting what you never received as a child, compassion and significance. This is just one of many examples of how humans match an inner need that they've created and haven't received it in years. We do it all the time, and it keeps us stuck in the addiction to suffering. If only the person craving this compassion and significance could go back in time to their childhood self and ask themselves two questions that would have an opportunity to counter these needs to bring about inner content. Those two questions would be, 1. I'm grateful for not receiving the compassion and such from others because, for example, it's made me realize how not to be with my own kids. And number two, I now see why I didn't receive my needs. Because mom and dad were fill in the blanks. We suffer because we see the world and our own circumstances strictly from our own perspectives and never take the time to see that maybe mom and dad were sick, broke, had a lot going on at the time. Life improves when you stop being a victim of past circumstances and start moving towards a vision of who you want to be. That windy road towards freedom comes with the realization that there's information you need that you don't currently have, or you have the knowledge but are too afraid to implement it. Inner resistance to change is the greatest roadblock to inner freedom. It screams how different these new ideas are. It screams how others may not accept the new you. And it screams the many pitfalls you'll have to move through to create a whole other identity and personality. The idea then is to respond to the screaming in a loving and compassionate way. Your subconscious mind loves you unconditionally, although to many people it may seem to be the opposite. Since familiarity equals safety, our system just wants to make sure that the path towards positive change is a safe path to embark on, and our job is to show it that it is through actions and reactions to the ideas we've accepted during childhood. Remember that the awakened ones see cause and effect, while the pessimist sees only chaos and suffering. The question is, what do you see? Day 7 As I sit here overlooking the beautiful rice patties in Bali, I'm pondering the beauty of our brains and how we work. My intuition is telling me that the images we hold in our minds and bodies is everything. The image of what's to come or what took place in the past. These images move at the speed of light past our conscious minds and become more important to us the more emotionally invested we are to the image. Think about a tabletop without any legs. The table has no strength to stand. Likewise, the images that flash through you have no strength behind them if there's no feelings present. The screaming fire truck 
that passes a person could bring up many images and possibilities, like, is the truck headed to my children's house? Friend's house? My house? Did I leave the stove on? What will my dog do? And so on and so forth. As is the case with a tree, the more branches a tree has, the more leaves it holds. The more evidence that supports the image, the more emotion it conjures up, which leads to the action. A decision is made that the stove might in fact still be on. The internal alarm system starts firing and the person rushes home to save their house from potentially burning down. Anxiety people are much quicker to jump to conclusions over facts. Their world revolves around worry because worry is a part of who they are until they recognize that it's just something they're doing. This realization is very much a game changer and can lead to a deeper exploration of who they have become. Life isn't complicated, but we sure find creative ways to make it so. Even the idea of peace scares the daylights out of a sensitized individual who must keep adding to their list of to-dos each and every day. These people are running from their past ideas. But didn't Winston Churchill leave us with some brilliant words of wisdom when he said, If you're going through hell, just keep going. My interpretation of his words are that there is no direct route to inner happiness and true fulfillment. It's only when hell is walked through, seen through, and understood that freedom shows up. When freedom shows up, the struggle that we are told comes with life fades as we embrace the laws of nature and come into harmony with the universal energy. You simply have to spend time in naturistic environments to allow your true voice to show up and learn how we must approach living. The river that flows beautifully and endlessly provides us with the lesson that struggle is only an idea that has been formed through habit. The flowing river translates into detachment from all things. A certain moving with rather than the inner need to control and alter things based on the needs of the ego mind. This flow allows us to be attuned to our inner voice that is attuned to the source of all energy, which then allows us to see past the ways of the suffering human being. The regrowth of beautiful grassy fields that reminds us that rebirth is our natural process. The human body may pass, but our soul will seek a new home once it's left the physical body. This understanding leads to overcoming the greatest fear of them all, the fear of dying. With it comes detachment from all we think we know uncertainty, and possibly tremendous pain. There is no need to fear dying because you've been there many times before. The waves in the ocean remind us that different sizes of challenges will show up in our lives, only to leave as quickly as they show up, if we can see through the little meaning they actually have. Nature provides the lessons that we must learn and follow if we are to detach from the addiction to suffering. I once celebrated at my grandpa's funeral for the lessons and joy 
he brought into my life. As others mourned his passing at the age of 92, my emotional state carried with it a message to everyone there. And that message was not to be greedy. To allow my grandfather to leave his physical body and take his place in life after life was the truest way to be. In life, we like to think we have control over the occurrences we're met with. The truth, though, is that we only have control over a small part of what's going on in our inner world. We have control over how we choose to view things in our physical reality, although even this path comes with it first, a battle to prove old ideas wrong. We have control over what action we take or don't take in any given circumstance, although many would argue that even this function is left to a deeper system within that has already decided your action far before you're consciously thinking what you're going to do. And we have control over the words we express to others, as this is one of those components that make up the emotional state that a person carries within them the most. The truth is that we may even have less control than we think in our lives. I mean, what if the movie The Matrix was insight into the actual occurrences to what's going on within and without right now? Maybe we're all plugged in to this game of life, trying our best to make sense of all this sensory data we're bombarded with today. The question then would be why? What's the point? Of any of this in the end? The answer to that lies in whatever you want it to be. Your belief over something makes it stronger or weaker within you. So choose your beliefs wisely, warrior. Defy the trillions of ideas that have been installed into you up to now, and never waste your time concerned over the ideas that life is too short when you're just wasting more of it, trying desperately to control what you have no control over. Hand your troubles over. Live as if you're dying, because you are. And love the very things you fear and hate. And I promise that one day, this life will make sense to you. You are more than anxiety. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and comment below. Love you all.